I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> the reading in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12. For I do not want you to be ignorant of a fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under, all under the cloud and that they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from settling our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Revelry, re yeah. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them, di uh, some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing fir firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that, so that you can endure it. So be it. He's gone. If you'll bow your heads with me, we'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can humbly come before your throne because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ that has atoned our sins forever and ever. And Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have that he rose again from the dead, that he taught us about the kingdom of heaven before he went, and then he left us with the power and the authority to live like him in this world. Father, may we listen to his words, to the, word, to the words that you say today, Father, through the Holy Spirit. May we cling to them. May we draw close to you through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be holy in this world, set apart for your service, for your glory and honor until your kingdom comes in fruition. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What letter would you receive? Do you have that as a title, Kim? She's looking. What does that mean to you? Well, I'm talking about Revelation because we're reading Revelation, right? And the scripture that we talked about, or that Polly read, talks about warnings that we have from the Old Testament, from, from Israel's history, from the children of God, those chosen to be holy and set apart in a foreign land. This week you should have read Leviticus chapter 25, Revelation chapter 3 through 9 in the book of Daniel. I'm going to go over the scripture that Polly read this morning and do a little emphasis, put a little emphasis on it, and then we'll keep on going. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, that's without knowledge, it's not necessarily a bad thing, that just means you need to get educated. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, they all passed through the sea. They all were taking out, taken out of Egypt, out of a land of slavery, so that they could worship the Lord their God. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. You may not have put that together before when you were reading and everything, but as you read Scripture, and I hope that you're reading this way, that you see Jesus Christ in Scripture because all Scripture points to God's love through Jesus Christ and how we can live a life separate from sin, holy, set apart for God's service. Verse 5, nevertheless, that's like the but word. That's the complete opposite. God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Let that be an example. These things occurred as examples to what? To keep us from setting our hearts. 
on the evil things as they did. It's so easy as a hypocritical Christian, as a, as a Pharisee, however you want to look at it, to read God's Word and say, oh, I'm not that kind of sinner. But we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We all deserve His wrath. But because of Jesus Christ, if we put our fa- believe in Him and put our faith and trust in Him, we can be saved. Saved from a life of sin, saved from the penalty of sin. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, that one always gets me, as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. If you read this week's readings, if you read the devotionals, that may hit on some of the devotional also. In fact, that scripture was taken from a devotional if you didn't catch it. It was a devotional on April 19th. The church in Corinth was definitely a church. They were the body of Christ set apart to be different in this world, to draw people in the kingdom. But they lived so much like the world that they were stagnant. Maybe they were even dead. But Paul says that they've got gifts of the Spirit, but they fight over gifts of the Spirit. It was such a disorganized body, I wonder how effective they were for Jesus in their world. They may have never fully experienced what Christian life ought to be like. And that's probably because they failed to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and ran the race with perseverance that was marked out before them, fixing their eyes on Jesus. Now I say that because I say that so that you can think about how your eyes are fixed on Jesus or not in this world. Because we live in a world of distractions. We live in a world that sin is out there in everything you see and do. Are you compromising with it or do you hate the sin that's out there and do you preach against it? And do you do what you can do to go against the injustice in the world? Are you ushering in the kingdom of heaven? They were all baptized in Christ. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank Christ. They had fellowship with Christ before Christ was even there. They celebrated the Lord's Supper and had fellowship with Him because of what Christ was going to do. We do it because of what Christ has done. Do you take it in an unworthy manner? Do you eat the bread which is Christ? Do you live on it and let it nourish you? Do you drink of the blood of the covenant? Nevertheless, nevertheless, those things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So how did they do this? How were they idolaters? How were they sexually immoral? How did they test Christ? Oh, how did they grumble? (laughs) We got that one again, don't we? Hmm. These things happened to them as examples and were written down. You can read about them every single day as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Have you thought about it that way? Are you living each day as if Jesus Christ were going to return tomorrow? Or let's look at it this way. Are you living each day as this is the last day that you have chance to tell someone about Jesus Christ so that they can be saved? What if tomorrow you don't have that chance? So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. So I ask these questions. What tempts you? Maybe it's not a temptation of sin, but what keeps you from being set apart? What tempts you from being set apart in this world like Christ in this world? Is it that you're afraid to sell all that you have and give it to the poor and follow Jesus? Is it that you're afraid to take up your cross? Is it that you can't deny yourself because you can't put yourself out of the control because there's all these things you've got to do and accomplish? And how would it get done without you? What idols do you have? (laughs) So many times when I sit down and talk with Christians intimately and stuff, they don't have any idols today. 
Just because there's not a graven image that you put on your shelf and you bow down to doesn't mean you don't have idols. An idol is something that competes for the affection of your heart against God. It can be your children. It can be your job. It can be your health. It's whatever you love more than you love serving the Lord. So how are you serving? That means ministering. How are you living a life that's set apart to advance the kingdom of God, to be like Jesus Christ in this world, to be His hands and feet until He returns, to be holy, holy, holy? Ezekiel 14, verses 1 through 8. Some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. Wherever you turn in the Old Testament, you see times of corruption and turning away from God, and you see a drawing to God. This cycle that should not be so, especially if you know what Jesus Christ has done for you. Why would you become adulterous and turn away? Why would you have other affections competing for your love for Him? Why would you not realize that your life was purchased with the precious blood of God's one and only Son? Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and put up wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. And guess what? Other people see your stumbling blocks too and they stumble over them just the same. Woe to those who put up stumbling blocks. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. When any of the Israel lights set up idols in their hearts and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces and then go to a prophet I the Lord will answer them myself in keeping with their great idolatry why does he do this why does the Lord our God do this I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel wow I deserve God's wrath, but in continually, even with my stiff neck disobedience, my love for other, for other things, my adulterous affairs, He continues to draw me to Him. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. Therefore say to the people of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Repent! Turn from your idols and renounce all your detestable practices. When any of the Israelites or any foreigner residing in Israel separate themselves for me, make themselves holy and set apart, and set up idols in their heart and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces and then go to a prophet to inquire of me, I, the Lord, myself will answer them. I will set my face against them. You have, been sanct you have been washed, you have been sanctified, you have been justified by the, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You have been set apart. Why would you ever turn back to your wicked ways? Why would you ever be a stumbling block? Why would you not live your life as a testimony for what God has done for you as if today were the last time you got the chance to do it? Why? Why? I will set my face against them and make them an example and a byword. That means a proverb, a truth to tell the world that you set your heart against God when He called you out to be set apart for Him. I will remove them from my people. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I ask again, what tempts you? What idols do you have? What are competing for the affections of your heart? How are you serving and ministering for God and His kingdom? What can you do more? What sins do I need to confess? What idols do I need to lay down at the foot of Jesus? So this week's devotional, maybe you read them, maybe you didn't. Here's some things that stuck out to me. Let this serve as a reminder that you are continuing in your faith, are you? Growing in holiness or impacting the world for the kingdom. The person who truly knows this sees the complacency as a grave danger and sees prayer as an absolute essential. 
For they know that it is only the Lord who can keep them standing day by day, moment by moment. Do you know this? Are you reading God's word? Are you studying? Are you telling others? Are you gathering together? Are you praying? Are you doing everything you can to spend time with the one who loved you enough to gave his life for you? Or is this an estranged relationship? The United States has never been keen on sovereign or on sovereignty. We prefer someone we can vote into a position and call upon as, a necess, necess, as necessary and vote when we choose. And if we're honest, this is often true of our approach to God as well. We prefer to control rather than to be controlled. God, however, cannot be ma managed or remade in our image. He is the sovereign Lord. We need to ask, would God, why would God not choose everyone? We need not to ask, I'm sorry, why would God not choose everyone? But rather we should ask, why would God choose to have mercy on anyone? Especially me. He did not choose us because of anything is in us, which would be occasion for pride in ourselves, but simply because of the love that is in Him, which should cause us to praise and worship Him. Should compel us to take our sin even more seriously for the purpose of Him, Choosing us, choosing us is that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In other words, while He didn't choose us because we are holy, we have been choose, chosen in order that we might become holy. Same things that Walt and I have been preaching about in the last few weeks. Is the Holy Spirit increasing in your life? Is humility increasing in your life? Then love's not increasing in your life and service is not increasing in your life if that's not true. There is no room for complacency in the Christian life. No matter what you have done and seen and no matter what you're standing in your church, therefore anyone, therefore let anyone who thinks he is standing take heed lest he fall. Ezekiel 34 was a passage we read this week in the devotional. Verse 11, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day, day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and all the settlement in the land. I will tend them in good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in, in a rich pasture, pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep, and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind the injured and strengthen the weak. Look at all the things that the Lord will do for us if we'll allow Him. But the sleek and the strong, those who think they are and try to stand on their own, I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. As for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will judge between one sheep and another, and between rams and goats. It is, not enough for you to feed on, is it not enough for you to feed on good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of the pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the water with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you shove with flank and shoulder, butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away. I will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant. Servant David will be prince among them. 
I, the Lord, have spoken. I wonder if we examine that as a church, what letter we would receive again. Are we satisfied? Do we muddy the water? Do we butt against one another? Are we an effective body calling out to the world that there is a sovereign God who loves them enough that they, He would send His Son to die for them? Do you have faith? Are you increasing in your faith? Do you walk by faith, fixing your eyes on Jesus? Do you understand that God desires your faith and He, he rewards those who diligently seeks Him? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So is the Lord really your shepherd? Thursday, I took a drive to the west side. I had to go see somebody to do some fixing on my hip. And he did a marvelous job. But when you drive that way, you kind of leave the world behind a little bit, don't you? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to spend some time listening to some Christian country. I know John listens to that song. But I was scratching my head when I was going over there and thinking, because the number one and number two songs, he said, were competing back and forth. And I don't even know, I might tell you wrong, so don't hold me on anything. I didn't catch it till the end when I heard the lyrics and everything. And thought about who the artists were and I'm not going to say who the artists were because we could go down that road but I will, won't but I thought about you know that is a struggle in the Christian life is exactly this this was the number one song this week it'll get you high it'll get you low that's just life and how it goes okay it's blessings and burdens and lessons and learning playing and working all these are with this to the end, not the working, but working. Okay, I'll try to do it like that. And healing and hurting. Okay? But then it's praying and cursing. Why? Okay, wait. Why? Because don't tell me you don't do it. If you grumble, you're cursing and complaining to God. And the destroyer killed people for that. There shouldn't be any praying and cursing. But yet we're guilty of it. So what do we need to lay before the throne? What do we need to confess to God? And if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In James 3 verse 10 it says, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursings. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? No. Or a grape vine bear figs? No. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom, by living a holy, set-apart life, as ministers and servants, slaves of Jesus Christ, telling their testimony even until martyrdom. Are you drawing to God or are you clinging on to the world, having set up idols in your heart and putting wicked stumbling blocks before others? Here was lyrics from the number two song. So you can see how the songs compete. Out on the streets of Jerusalem, something was going down. People were shouting and praising God. A, a crowd was gathered around. Peter started preaching. His words were clear and true. The power was strong, and before too long, everybody knew. This church is on fire, burning with power of God Almighty, serving Him and praising His name is our only desire. Go and tell your neighbor all that God has done for you. Jesus said you are the light, and this church is on fire. The fire that started long ago is burning bright today. It's spreading all around the world wherever people pray. The church of God is moving as long as there's a soul to tell that Jesus is the Son of God and Jesus is alive and well. The two competing songs, the two competing lyrics tell me of my competing darkness and light, mine, the church itself, and this should not be so. For God has called me to be holy, holy, holy. And Jesus said that we are to be perfect, complete, as our Heavenly Father is complete. 
So I have to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. I have to confess my sins. I have to draw close to him. I have to decrease so that he might increase. Is that what you're doing? Is that what we're doing? Why in the world would we let other loves and other idols come in and compete? So you should have finished Leviticus, and I told you last week, the last chapter basically said everything is the Lord's especially those things set apart for Him. Everything is the Lord's. They were created and designed by Him. They're for His glory and honor. We're the ones that sin, and He's given us a remedy for that sin. It's S-I-N is replaced with S-O-N. Period. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through Him. And then you're reading Revelation. The word is apocalypsis. Do you know that? What, is it, what does it mean to you when you hear the word apocalypse? You think of doom and destruction and whatever. Well, you probably do if you're part of the world. But if you're part of the kingdom of heaven, you see that Revelation is revealing that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is worthy. He is reigning now through His church, and He will forever reign. Amen? That's what you should see when you're reading Revelation. And you should examine those letters to those churches and think about those things because Jesus is writing this revelation, not revelations through John to these churches that says here's what you're doing right, here's what you're doing wrong repent before this happens to you repent before it's too late Revelation 1 verse 4, Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before His throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and He has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve His God and Father. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Jesus' revelation to seven churches living in their time as foreigners, exiles, aliens in this world that they are to be a light to the world, to proclaim God's love, the good news of Jesus Christ so that they may overcome, that they may be victorious, and that they may be harvested into the kingdom of God. Revelation 1 verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstamps and among the lampstamps was someone like the Son of Man which Ezekiel talked about, which Daniel talks about. Dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest, a king, royalty. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes were like blazing fire. If you think, if you read Daniel you'll know that Daniel sees the same type vision. His feet were bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. Are you just reading your Bible and not keeping it? Are you reading it and not applying it? When you read that, that verse about loving your enemies, do you just skip past it? It's easy to. But it's not what Jesus taught, is it? He said, if your enemy asks you for your coat, give him the shirt off of your back also, naked and exposed before the Lord. That's my interpretation. Don't quote me exactly on that. that, That's not exactly what the scripture says. But will I do that for anyone? Or especially will I do it for an enemy? I'll tell you what, I'll be honest. I have trouble doing it for my wife. Right? Because I have that sin problem, that I problem in there instead of the son problem. I want my way. I want the things that I think are right. I don't want to deny myself. That's tough. I certainly don't want to take up an instrument of suffering and death. But I do want to follow Jesus, so those two requirements need to be done first, don't they? His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And that terrified John. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though I was dead. 
Then he placed his right hand on me. He reached out and touched me. That reminds me of a song too, doesn't it? And he said, do not be afraid because I am the first and the last. Oh, I have nothing to fear because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I am the living one. I was dead, so I will rise again. And now, look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. They have no power. Right? Therefore, the, what you have seen, what is now, and will, what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lamb stamps is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, messengers, however you want to put that. And the seven lamp stands are the seven churches. And we know what the double-edged sword is, don't we? So we have churches and we have messengers to the churches, whether it's a preacher, whether it's a guardian angel, however you want to say that. And we have the word of God that we need to proclaim by living it so that it is sharp and powerful and double-edged cutting in and cutting out and how can we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ unless we live like Jesus in this world we can't we're called a hypocrite and that's why people don't want any part of our Jesus so we've got to be like Jesus in this world we've got to be holy 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 set apart for his service not have other affections and other love not have other idols or not have idols so let's look at Daniel in Daniel chapter 1, in the third, uh, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Oh, this is a story about kings and kingdoms. Oh, so is Revelation. So is the story of the Bible. Kings and kingdoms. In which kingdom are you, going to, are you going to serve? Are you part of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? Jesus stayed 40 days after he rose and taught about the kingdom of God so that his disciples would understand that and live differently than the kingdom of man. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of, Jeho king of Judah, into his hand. You know, he hadn't been king but just a moment on the throne. If you know who his father was also, his father was Josiah. If you remember, he took uh, the thrown at a very early age as a child and he discovered the law in the temple and he reinstated it he tore his royal robes and repented to God in holy fear because of God's judgment sounds like revelation doesn't it a revealing but you don't have anything to fear if you know who Jesus Christ is he tore down the pagan idols he reinstated the festivals but his son's heart was focused on idols and he put wicked stumbling blocks before the children of God. Daniel chapter 1 verse 2 And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. That's what happened because he did not value what God had given him. Along with some of the articles from the temple of God these he carried off to the temple of his God and gods in Babylon and put them in the in the treasury of the house of his God. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service. Did you catch that? We serve one king or the other, one kingdom or the other. He's trying to brainwash these best of these best young men to serve the kingdoms of this world rather than the kingdoms of God. To bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. The best of the best to brainwash them in the ways of the world, the things that we think we need, so that we concentrate more on what we are going to eat and what we are going to wear, and our Heavenly Father knows that we need these things. The king assigned, excuse me, he uh, was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians, of the worldly empire. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were trained for three years, and after they, that, they entered into the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief's officials gave them new names. He changed them from their names that relate to Jehovah God to names that relate to the gods of the world. 
so that they would be set apart for those gods to worship and serve them. You know them better by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Daniel, verse 8, resolved not to defile himself, not to let himself become unholy, set apart for God's service. With the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief officials for permission not to defile himself in that way. As you're reading Revelation and as you study Scripture, period, you know you have a new name, you have a new identity in Christ. Are you living by that new identity and that new name? Or are you living by the gods of this world name for you? The book of Daniel tells the story of these men and how they lived in a foreign kingdom, to, to put it plainly. And they lived for God in this foreign world, even at a young age. The best of the best who could have said, oh, yes, I want fame. I want my looks to, go, to govern. I have all these things. But they didn't set them up as idols. Instead, they, laid them, they denied that, laid them down at the foot of the cross, and served our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may or may not know it too, but Daniel is written in Hebrew and in Aramaic. And I'm going to tell you my thoughts about that. Because <laughs> we don't know for sure. But the first chapter is written in Hebrew because it's t telling the... Israelites setting up this story and in Aramaic we see it told to the world and then we see it back in Hebrew because we know that how we're supposed to live oh just like Revelation ought to be something that's a blessing to me when I read it not something that scares me and I don't have to know all the answers but I know what the revealing is I know that the revealing is if I belong to God I will forever be with him and if I belong to God why would I not live for him? Jesus will reign. Yeah, there might be some apocalyptic things that you think about, terrible things that happen of judgment and everything, but I don't have anything to worry about. I don't have to worry about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I don't have to worry about if I'm a part of it. I don't have to worry about if I lose my life for the sake of Jesus Christ because I know that then He will welcome me into heaven. Look back and read about Stephen. Jesus Christ stands up and says, Hey, I'm proud of you basically. Again, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> Brief synopsis. You have a choice. You have a choice. You see the examples whether you're going to live like the world or live like a foreigner in this world, whether you're going to be set apart for the kingdom of God or not set apart, to live like Jesus in this world and bring Him glory and honor and draw others. And it's up to them whether they do or not. I, was, was Nebuchadnezzar saved in the end? I don't know. Maybe we'll meet him in heaven. He turned to God, he turned away. I don't know. Okay, don't point fingers at me. The reason I say I don't know is because that's my life too, guys. Sometimes I'm on the mountaintop with God, and other times I'm in the valley low. And if you're honest, you know that. King Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 2, is warned in a dream and praises God for a season. Then in chapter 3, he sets himself up so that people will bow down to him instead. Hmm. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't defile themselves. They're bound, bound, bound firmly. It says a couple times that they're bound and thrown into the fiery furnace that is heated up so hot that other men die trying to put them in there. And the only thing that gets burnt up, not a hair on their head, the only thing that gets burnt up are the ropes or whatever is binding them because they know they're free when they walk through the fiery flames with Christ because there's four people walking in the flames. When you walk with Jesus Christ, the things you think you're bound up by hold nothing to you. They're all burnt up. They were burnt up the day you were washed, the day you were sanctified, the day you were justified. So don't hold on to those things. Don't think you can't. Don't think you're less than. Don't let these things control you. And certainly don't live your life for, for your sins, your evil desires. Don't set your hearts on worldly things, but set your heart and fix your eyes on Jesus. Chapter 4, this time the revelation is that the downfall of the king is coming unless he repents. And if you didn't catch it in chapter 4, verse 34, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. And when he did this, my sanctity was stored. 
Oh, man, that makes me want to fix my eyes on Jesus every single moment of every single day so that I, my mind is clear that I know these things have no power over me. I know that whatever happens to me, it's okay. That I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified God, glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At the same time that, that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my no, nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the kingdom of heaven because what he does is right and his ways are just. And though those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Chapter 5, what about the king's son? Could he see the writings on the wall? Get it? Okay, you've got to be reading along. Maybe you've got that one. But that hand that just wrote on the wall and wrote, verse 25, this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. Yeah, scripture tells you exactly what it says here. Verse 26, here is what these words mean. Mene means God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez is a singular of parson. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Your days have a number on them. Might be tomorrow. Might be today. Might be ten years from now. Who knows what it is? But are you serving each and every day as if they, were, they belong to God, set apart and holy, and as if tomorrow you wouldn't have another day? If not, why not? That doesn't mean you don't go about in the mission field that God has put you in, but it means that you let Him be sovereign Lord of your life. You look for the opportunities that you can tell others about Jesus Christ. You look where you can serve, how you can give, how you can bring about justice in this world. We don't live up to build kingdoms on sand because they'll get blown away. You have been weighed. That means that you've been measured. You, the scales have been balanced. God knows every thought, every idle word, every deed that you have, and you will be accountable for the life that He breathed into you. And Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Well, you know what? There shouldn't be a divided kingdom, should they? That's why I gave the lyrics of that song. I'm either with Jesus and gathering, or I'm against Jesus and I'm scattering. There's no gray. It's black and white. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you profess Him with your mouth, that He is Lord, then you are saved. Chapter 6. Oh, well, that very night, what happened to that king? His life was required, wasn't it? Chapter 6, Daniel will not defile himself for the new king. is thrown in the lion's den. And if you study history and you see, you'll find out many things that God did through Darius and Cyrus the Great, how God does use these kingdoms and kingdoms, kings and kingdoms. And if you read Daniel's, you'll see some of the most accurate prophecy fulfilled period that we see and yet we have not seen some of that fulfilled yet because Jesus Christ has not returned yet. Daniel didn't understand it. John didn't understand it. So don't spend time trying to understand all of Revelation but instead look back at the letters and see how you're living right and how you're living wrong and repent and turn to Jesus by salve that will cure your blindness. Chapter 7, this time Daniel has a dream. It says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the ancients of days took his seat. 
That's a revealing of what will happen. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. Remember I told you that when we read that in Revelation? His throne was flaming with fire and his wheels were ablaze. A river of fire was flowing coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended to him. Ten thousand <clears throat> times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. That will happen. The book of Daniel goes on to present kingdom after kingdom which we can see happen and what we know without a doubt will happen. Chapters 8 through 12 have many apocalyptic rep, uh, revelations. Some that, all that were written about the future, but some now that are history, some that will still be future. Worldly kingdoms and their kings will come to an end unless they repent and turn to the king of all kings. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. <clears throat> Are we living as exiles, ushering in the kingdom of heaven? Or are we living for the kings and kingdoms of this world, being brainwashed? There are a lot of sevens in the book of Daniel, a lot of sevens in the book of Revelation. Hmm, interesting. I just say that so that you can go explore it. <laughs> a lot of thought processes here, but the biggest process that I get to every time I read is that Jesus is king, that he loved me enough to die for me, that he not only saved me, but empowers me to live for God, that I am called to be his priest. And the world grows strangely dim the more and more I understand that. Daniel 12, verse 8, to the end of the book of Daniel. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome of all of this? He replied, go your way, Daniel. Because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. But what was Daniel's way? To be a light, no matter what the cost. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that caused desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way to the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Problem is, so many times we concentrate on, what is this 1,290 days? What's this 1,335 days? Let me highlight what I just read there. Go your way, the race that is set out before you fixing your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of your faith, running it with these other runners who are running this marathon. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to do their wicked deeds. Blessed is the one who waits and reaches the end, that finish line, right? As for you, go your way, said again, till the end so you don't fall short that you're not tossed around that you don't lose your anchor or your way and then at the end of the days you will rise up to receive your allotted inheritance wow that I should be called a child of God that he loves me that much next week we'll continue with the revelation of Jesus Christ and put that more into perspective but I want to close with this that day will come when everything every thought, every word, every deed will be laid bare naked, exposed that's what revelation means no hiding anything <laughs> what you whispered in secret will be yelled from the rooftops as Jesus said so listen to what the, letter, what the ending of one of his letters was to the churches Revelation 3, verse 5. The one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father in heaven, may we hear your word and obey your word. 
May you just prick our heart just even minutely to get a comprehension of the love that you could have for us. That you knew we would sin against you and you knew that it would cost your son's life. But yet you said, you're worth it, Alan. Oh God, thank you for calling me and setting me apart. Help this world to grow strangely dim as I approach your throne for all eternity. And I thank you and praise you that you made that possible through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen.